Welcome everyone. I'm very excited to introduce you to this very important topic, which is raising caring kids in a world that can be cruel. I slightly edited the title and the fact of the matter is there has been a dramatic decrease in caring and it's evidence. The evidence of that is found both in studies and you know, empirical data, but data, but also absolutely lots of examples in our own life where we see that children are just not entering adulthood or even at, at the age of, you know, young children, we're seeing caring not being in evidence like it used to. So it's a huge, huge issue. And I had said recently in another presentation I did on raising great kids in the digital age that I would talk about raising caring kids soon. So that's what this is. You know, the follow-up presentation to that wonderful, wonderfully received presentation. So a few things for those of you who are new, and I, I see in the, the comments we have new people, which is fantastic. Um, I'm Jacqueline R. Green. I founded, I've been a parenting educator, coach, and a speaker since the year 2000, which was a year after the, the birth of my second child when I really realized I needed to get some help. I started taking training and started teaching. I host and founded The Great Parenting Show in 2010, and we've had well over 30,000 listeners since then, which is fantastic. And I've been featured in magazines um, on various um, newspapers and TV, including things like the Huffington Post Live, Today's Parent Magazine, and Globe and Mail, etc. I feel like, and I, I have been blessed to work with over 150 well, do over last count over 135 different separate interviews with different parenting related educators from all walks of life and really some of the best people on, on the planet on these topics. Really blessed with the people I've been able to work with. And yet I feel strongly that my roots, uh, it's at least as important that I began in the trenches like everyone else and in many ways more in the trenches than many of the parenting educators today because I found myself very quickly going from, you know, gazing into my newborn's eyes and vowing to be the parent that I knew that he deserved. And, and you know, we all have that moment where we're just clear that we would move mountains for our children. And of course, it's not a moment, but we all have that first moment when, when we really realize that what we would do for our child. And unfortunately though found myself within that first year really ground to a halt and really really disappointed and horrified by my own behavior and by times where I was you know 90 percent of the time I'm sure I was being a calm loving parent or at least very much a loving parent if not calm but I absolutely would lose it some of the time and unfortunately that is too calm and uh version nowadays a too common uh, experience for parents and fortunately when we get off track and we are you know screaming at our kids occasionally even even once every once in a while it really is, threatens their sense of security and really it causes them to get knocked out of their their proper relationship with us and so certainly by the time i had the two children i had problems with both of the children you know the beginnings of sibling rivalry and unfortunately i'm for many people you know it's a real chicken and egg situation that my ex and i had lots else going on because i did i am the upcoming author of strong enough to stay smart enough smart enough to go which references the fact that I did leave and take the children when they were young into a woman's shelter so that I could stop the escalating physical violence. But the fact of the matter is for many, many couples, the majority of couples nowadays with healthy, otherwise healthy partners, they are not experiencing happily ever after the parenting challenges knock um, the couple's relationship off track. And so unfortunately, this is a very common story nowadays. And it is certainly my passion to help couples to stay and, and in fact grow the, their love and their commitment to each other and resolve parenting issues. So it's a, such a huge issue that I know people can relate to. I share all this because the fact of the matter is I was so profoundly blessed. Two paths, I became aware of two paths that had 
appeared and, and you know that divergent pass in the yellow wood and I was able to take the path much less traveled nowadays but actually in so many ways it's harnessing the aspects of the path that that for eons had us as humans thriving as a, as a species and able to have large families where kids were, were largely turning out by what was then deemed successful largely turning out similar to their parents and comparatively arguably in many ways turning out much more successfully than most than the than in mass than children are today but the interesting thing is so despite getting on this dramatically better path and i really i, I show this beautiful picture of my children soon my daughters seem to be graduating as well and I think you can get even a sense from their faces, like they're, they're lovely, very caring young adults. And I love both of them work with children. My daughter's lifeguard. My son has worked for a number of years with the library and is doing the summer reading program for the second year in a row this summer when he comes home from college. The fact of the matter is I was absolutely not on that path before. I wasn't on the path to, to happy children, let alone successful um, and caring children. So what were the two major differences that got me onto a path of having caring children? I am so grateful for learning two things. One is the mindset. You know, there really is a, a mindset. And you're going to hear a little bit about this today, but that, that isn't the main part of the discussion today. But the energy we bring to our parenting and, and our ability to control our emotions some of that you're going to get today because as you shift your mindset and you understand, as you shift sorry, your perspective and you understand what it takes to raise caring children, that's going to help already with your mindset. But that was one of the keys to get my kids on a different path. And the other one is learning the keys to helping your kids to mature and want to behave. And I'm going to be touching on, on some of that today. Absolutely. Um, and I'll get into in just a second why I say some of that. Um, so that's the content of today's presentation. I want to acknowledge my deep debt to Dr. Gordon Newfeld because he was the first of, of many parenting educators who are influential to me, but definitely helped me with that second, you know, getting that idea, that sense that there was a completely different path I could be on and that once I got on that path, my kids would want to behave for me. You know, even just that concept is, is profound. But much of my work is very, very grounded in Dr. Gordon Newfeld's work. So the reason I share the personal parts and, and you know, even the details like going to the woman's shelter, and sometimes I do talk about, you know, at my lowest, I absolutely was at a place where I could understand women who took their, their kids out and, and committed suicide because I really got to a very, very dark place in my parenting. And I share that because I know that Dr. Gordon Newfeld, who is, is sublime, the one piece he couldn't give me was the sense that it was possible to go from the parenting mess that I was in to the, the parenting master, to, to the greatness, to being that parent I, I knew that my children deserved and I wanted to be for them. So I love to offer and be really clear that no matter where you're at, you absolutely can transform. And that, that means if your kids are in their 30s, 40s, whatever, you can make a profound difference in their life. So my sharing is, is to give you that buoy, that life raft to, to help you know that there's hope and that you can just start getting the tools that you need to turn things around. Um, one last thing I wanna say though about hope, like without hope, it's crazy, parents so often come to me and they're stuck with overwhelm and it's so wild because when you change your mindset overwhelm goes away and you can accomplish crazy things that that moments before didn't seem possible when you shift your mindset and of course sometimes you you can't shift your mindset quickly that's where acquiring more tools is, is really really powerful but the hope and understanding that no matter how challenging things seem to you right now and no matter how uncaring for example your kids seem that that things can shift is often what makes the difference for people so this whole presentation when i said i'm going to give you some of the information in this presentation this presentation is focused on insight and focused on getting you the insight that you need to to see the road ahead i love Another webinar that I will be presenting again in a couple months is my Great Parenting Roadmap. It's my five steps to great 
parenting and certainly what I'm talking about here today is incorporated in, in those five steps very much. And mindset is the first step. The fact of the matter is that great parenting roadmap, the idea is when you've got the map and you can see where you are, where you want to get to, you can get there. Right. So the key is to have the insight about, oh, wow, you know, here, here's the overall vision. And then you can figure out the details. So really, it's about teaching you to fish you know, that, that beautiful parable from the Bible of, of being taught how to fish and not given fish, right? And so I don't want to give you just specific things, although I will give you some specifics, but I want to teach you how to raise caring children. So the insight leads to being, it's really the equivalent of your GPS, right? When you are clear where you are, where you want to go and, and the, like, for example, if you, if you're clear that you want to go you know, northeast as opposed to specific instructions that will help you have your GPS. So if you go north for a while, then, then you know you have to bear east for a while in order to correct. The fact of the matter is that insights or perspective shift really, you know, arguably, of course, you can forget anything, but the chances of losing a perspective shift is very small compared to specific details that are so, so easy to forget. So, I and, and I also want to emphasize too the other problem with specific details is that we are speaking, raising caring children is about taking your family from where you're at to where you want to go. And there's different routes to get there, right? And your family may, because you're in a different place already, and you may choose a different route even to fit into your culture or your unique situation. And so that's where it is important to begin with a real insight approach. So I am asking your permission. I'd like you to put this in the chat. Is um, is it okay with you to leave with, with lots of questions? Because the truth of the matter is, if I've done my job here, you're, you're going to leave inspired and you're also going to leave with questions about, oh, you know, what are some ways I can do more of building the alignment and things like that? And I am delighted through the Facebook page, through you can email us at, at our support at Great Parenting Show, email, you know, future presentations. I'm very happy to support you with answering those questions. And I hope that you are okay with leaving with questions. So the bad news, there is bad news about raising caring children nowadays. The fact of the matter is we can't force caring. And that one is so interesting because there's a lot of attempts to force caring nowadays. And we'll talk about that in a bit. There also is absolutely unequivocally more and more uncaring behavior out there. It's fascinating, a recent study that is referenced in Reclaiming Conversation, the fabulous book by Sherry Turkle, and it talks a lot about social media and the impact of social media and how powerful Reclaiming Conversation for parents is just phenomenal. You want caring kids, you want kids who are interacting with you and talking with you. Anyways, 40% decrease, one study talks about 40% decrease in the empathy as um, in a 10 year span and college students, and like dramatic drop in empathy. Another, she talks about great uh, kids who are 12, dramatic de decrease in shows of caring in the classroom or on the school grounds and, and that type of thing. And in this case, she's attributing it to social media and people not being used to even looking in each other's eyes and seeing you know, the, the, what's happening, and which makes a big difference for caring. So, so there is true bad news that, that Caring is unfortunately not naturally happening like it used to, and there's huge ramifications for our world if that trend continues. There is, though, great news, and the great news is caring is 100% natural when you set up the right conditions, and I'm going to talk about that more later, and you absolutely can learn how to evoke caring. And I, again, that's the purpose of this presentation. So what I'll cover today, and I'm going to talk about three main topics, our three main um, sections. I'm going to talk about an overview of, of caring. I'm going to talk about what makes children uncaring and why we have this, this decrease of uncaring children, increase of uncaring children. And I'm going to then end with the main points about how to raise caring children. So first off, what is caring and why is it so important? What is caring? I, when you look at a definition, the two points that are most pertinent to us is, you know, 
feeling concern or interest in attaching importance to something and also looking after or providing for the needs of someone. And definitely that second definition is particularly apt in, in this um, context. As I said already, caring is natural if you have the right conditions. And this, I will share a fascinating story that illustrates this. In I have shared this a number of times recently in presentations because it is such a powerful example of how natural caring is if the conditions are right. The story is of children who are called the boxcar children in Nazi Germany, and they were discovered it was discovered that these children had been living together because their parents had been taken and either, you know, they're separated from their parents and either their parents, whether they lived or didn't live for a period of time, they had to live without their parents. And what was happening that they discovered is that the older children were very naturally caring for the younger ones all the way to doing things like depriving themselves of food, just like any other, you know, any parent would have done, which just really highlights. I will talk about and I'll highlight why that happened a little bit later, but the fact of the matter is it just highlights how if children are in the right um, situation, it's just like maturation, which we'll talk more about too. It is a very natural process. And of course it has to be that way because if you think about it, up until recently, you know, the last hundred plus years like prior to that education and knowledge you know 150 years ago people if they had to read parenting books like we're doing today and and constantly trying to learn more about parenting we wouldn't have thrived as a species right so caring our species depends on we are a very collaborative and um, communal species and so caring has to be something that's natural if the conditions are right so why is caring so important? You know, I'm highlighting this just briefly, but I think it's worth touching on. The fact of the matter is, you know, I just did say like caring is a key part of us being a communal a species that's based on communal living. So the effect on the world is massive when we have either more caring children becoming adults or less. It's also a huge effect on your child. One way is on your child's social and emotional intelligence, because if your child doesn't care about others, that dramatically decreases their social and emotional intelligence. And so many fascinating studies about how EQ, which emotional intelligence has been coined by Dr. Daniel Goldman, um, and I shouldn't give him a doctorate, but I, I believe he's a doctor. But anyways, Daniel Goldman, who's a well-known writer who's written about social emotional intelligence, talks about EQ being more important than IQ in terms of your child's success. And there actually are a lot of people who have very high IQ who really, really struggle because of having low EQ. So really important that your child's caring so that they have that social and emotional intelligence. An interesting byproduct that something we all want is that a caring child is also a much safer child. Your emotions are meant to help your child and each one of us. We're actually armed with really a powerful, the GPS analogy works when you think of it not just even as a GPS, but it's like a radar system, right? And in order to have a caring child, you have to have a child who's got their emotions intact and really can experience and feel their emotions. And a huge byproduct is keeping your child safe. So what makes children uncaring? I'm going to talk about a couple main things. Your hardened hearts, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, immaturity and flatlining of culture. So your hardened hearts, and I, I give this picture of, of a teen, you know, giving the finger to someone because she has the perfect facial expression for blasé, could not give a damn in this case, right? She couldn't give a hoot. She does not care. That's definitely a great example of a hardened heart. A child like that who's got a hardened heart, she is not demonstrating or feeling caring feelings a lot of the time, particularly in, in this instance. Hopefully she's having times where she is. Um, it's interesting because empathy requires us to feel. And empathy you know, is so, such a key part of 
having caring children of being caring of course i love this quote by elizabeth stone making the decision to have a child is momentous it's is to decide forever to have your heart go walking around outside your body the fact of the matter is when our children are born what gets us to go to her clay and efforts sometimes right and and you know i'm one of many many examples really most of us as parents profoundly and i would argue that the only parents who don't profoundly change their lives for for children are parents who sometimes nowadays aren't in right relationship with their kids and aren't actually tuned in enough because of whether or not you keep the exact same career and things like that your life changes profoundly when you have children and that's a, a perfect example of how natural caring is when your instincts are evoked in the right way and so that's why all of a sudden it is like empathy requires us to feel we feel so deeply when our children are born it is like having our show our hearts walking around outside us so why do more and more children have hard hearts and i'd love you to think about this for a minute another great thing to put in the chat box and by the way it's great when you are commenting in the chat box because it can help you to learn that much more when you are even attempting to answer the questions even if you're completely wrong because it gets your mind thinking and and that's show, showing in studies to really in, improve your learning the fact of the matter is your children have hard hearts because and, and i shouldn't say your children because hopefully yours don't but in general children have much more hard hearts than they used to and they're much more defended against their soft emotions than they used to because the fact of the matter is they need to protect themselves. If you think about it, you think about why does a shell get developed on a crab or something like that, right? And, and even for us, and we have various ways where we put an external shell on us in different situations, including you know, a helmet for certain things in, in order to protect ourselves physically. Psychologically, if we are being wounded too much, we have to provide ourselves with protection. So the Newfeld's way of saying it is vulnerability too much to, to bear. If your child is experiencing like too much, being vulnerable is great. Brene Brown, I love her material and she talks so much about vulnerability, but the fact of the matter is vulnerability doesn't just require courage. Vulnerability requires that you are in a situation where it is safe. Because it, there are times where it is not safe to, or appropriate at all to be vulnerable. And if your children are experiencing too much of that, they literally, psychologically, it's not conscious, they will shut down their access to their emotions. Um, now, interestingly enough, one of the reasons why vulnerability can be too much to bear that's nothing to do with modern challenges, but it's so too bad because there's so many ways that our modern world is causing our children to have more and more psychological wounds as i'm going to talk about in just a minute and i'll get into that a lot more but even there's an increase in how sensitive children are nowadays and i'll get into that more um, and as i said you know so two reasons why your children need more protection why they have vulnerability too much to bear one is sensitivity and the other one's too many psychological wounds and we'll talk about that so the sensitivity i think it's it's fascinating and interesting even though i chose a picture of you know, the princess and the pea and a, and a princess being sensitive the fact of the matter is no one's exactly sure why but boys are showing to, to literally be birthed and coming into the world more sensitive than ever before and more sensitive even the girls but there's a genuine increase in sensitivity and you know there could be so many reasons for it but the fact of the matter is that unfortunately you know as, as i want to emphasize it's very much on the rise but the fact of the matter is it means that those children are that much more challenging to raise if you don't especially if you're not sensitive to their needs right and many of us as parents are not anywhere near as sensitive as our children so it makes it harder to understand them and definitely some of the your big emotions that they're having over teeny things and the fact that they can't go with the flow there are other reasons for that besides just sensitivity but many of you have very sensitive children and that's making it dramatically more difficult for them to go with the flow and adapt 
The fact of the matter is for those sensitive children, you know, that William Wordsworth idea of the world is too much with us, right? That it is so challenging to be a sensitive child in a world that is insensitive to sensitivity. So, so you getting better at being sensitive and shielding your child when they're sensitive is critical. And I can talk more about some examples of that if you want. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, to go back to the idea of a crustacean or whatever, you know, in this case, one analogy that I've had over my lifetime since having kids is thinking about yourself like sometimes, I don't know where I got the same from, but feeling like a peeled shrimp, right? Feeling like I don't have my shell. Well, well, if you imagine that that's what a sensitive child feels like and they need help with developing armor and they need you to be their armor and there are many ways that you can do that. Um, the fact of the matter is sensitive children can absolutely um, thrive and the, the picture that I chose to depict is, you know, and, and there's a negative in the picture that I don't want you to take, but the fact of the matter is sensitive children can thrive and it it's a game when you think of caring being natural and ha just worrying about the right conditions. You know, you look at how crazy it is that we have plants going through cement because that's just how natural that drive is. Your sensitive child can do fine, but you do have to be willing to keep that sensitivity in mind and really understand this wounding. Um, I want to just answer one question because it's finally sensitive like easier to cry or empathy to others well Renee that's a great question it depends there's many ways sensitivity can show up one of them can be like physical sensitivity to things like you know the tag in your clothes and to allergies are on the rise and in asthma and all the different things like that so there's physical ways absolutely though emotional ways as a as well and i just want to so so a, a highly sensitive child can definitely be quicker to cry can have more empathy for others no question but the interesting thing is to answer the news question is under sensitive to the point of uncaring issue massive but that's because of your child having to harden their heart or a child having to harden their heart, having to shut off those emotions. And we'll talk about this whole presentation is about giving you a sense of what, and some tools for turning things around, right? So that that uncaring, under sensitive child can, can be more sensitive again. It's fascinating. Some bullies, some, some really aggressive kids are sensitive kids who have had to harden them, their feelings off because literally, just like physically, we have a natural reaction to move away from a flame, you know, and because it hurts. If our sensitive children are encountering a world that is not friendly to them, that is causing them to be wounded again and again and again constantly, that child has to develop a shell around them they have to harden so it's not even a choice on, on their part part and great thanks Colleen sharing about that her son who you said is more sensitive than your three girls is much more aware of others feelings much more diplomatic even more nurturing and that's a sign Colleen you've been creating the right conditions please anyone who's listening if you realize that you've been creating conditions that your child is hardened it don't even frame it that way because you are parenting in the craziest time ever. Children are naturally dramatically less caring than they used to be because there's so many ways that our world is set up so that our children have to be defended and less, you know, what some of you like Colleen and love that you're in a situation where you've been able to have create conditions that are favorable but that it is not for those of you who aren't in that situation it's not because you're not as good a mom or dad it's just because things have conspired not to be that way for you right it's just so critical you don't take the invitation to be to get guilty and down on yourself because you didn't choose to parent in the craziest time ever but you are getting the information that, that you need and getting that information can make this the best time ever so to move on, something I really encourage you to stay full on to your sensitive kids is that your sensitive kids have many kids racehorse um, picture because the fact of the matter is that many of us are aware that you know a racehorse is like a greyhound 
dog. Like they're they're sleek. They're thin skin, literally, compared to I. I grew up on a ranch, so I know my horses. But the same with you know, you you think of a lab retriever versus a greyhound. One of them has a thick coat of hair and and thicker skin, or at least the protection of all that hair in between. And you, if you have a sensitive child, giving them that picture, which I did years ago with my sensitive daughter, that you know she's this sleek, fine, exquisite creature, and her brother is much more of a quarter horse, or he's he's more of a lab retriever, and both of them have gifts. But really presenting to your sensitive child that they have gifts can be huge because they are exquisitely aware of how they're different in, in most cases too and in many cases for them it feels like a curse as well anyways i wanted to emphasize that they're so huge gifts but they too is at your child being sensitive but they need at least one or two wise adult to help them with that protection and and when i talked about um the second thing about you know, there's more sensitive children than ever before. There's also too many psychological wounds, too many reasons why your child needs to be defended nowadays. Um, I'm going to give you some examples um, of psychological wounds. So too much separation. And this one is fascinating. You can work with separation and, and you can work with whatever amount of separation you need to have. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. That's one of the specific things I'm going to give you some tips on and tools with. But the fact of the matter is, it's fascinating. They have um, kids right now in um, preschool, they've done some studies about the cortisol levels that are actually at levels that, that are considered to in, um, impede their brain's healthy development. And why do they have so much cortisol levels? It's because of feeling the psychological wound of being separated from their primary um connection, the primary alignment. I'm not going to get much into alignment today, but it, it's a very real thing that your child needs that deep connection with you, right? So too much separation without you knowing how to mitigate it. Shame, and, and shame is something I'll, I'll talk briefly about in just a minute. And definitely too many psychological wounds from your child feeling way too alarmed. So too much separation. A separation that's physical separation, um, a psychological separation, and emotional separation. All, all of those are, you know, they're kind of layered on each other, but you can actually have children who are physically in the room with you and are not connected with you, right? And they can, can um, be feeling that separation from you. So it's not just physical separation by any means. So I'll talk more about this in a little bit. Um, shame. I want to say a few things here just to heighten and inspire you to keep going down the positive, gentle, proactive parenting route and leaving the, the prevailing practice of really shame based discipline. We talk a lot about, I talk about it sometimes as pain based discipline, but really is, is the psychological pain is often shame. Um, Shame is feeling basically that something is wrong with you. And Brene Brown has been brilliant. I'd love for you to comment if you're aware of her work, um, that she is being brilliant for, I mentioned her about vulnerability earlier, talking a lot about shame. And when your child is experiencing vulnerability as, you know, they're too provoked by, by a shame response and that, they, then they will shut down from those feelings very, very fast. Because they have to psychologically, they they have mechanisms. Because really, our survival as a species, we need to be able to function. So when pain is too much to bear, psychological pain, we have psychological mechanisms that kick in whether we want them to or not. Um, ways that we can contribute to our child's shame, our two children, you know, having shame, not communicating how important our child is to to us. And sorry for that typo, um, but not communicating how important our child is to us and we'll discuss that more when i discuss separation in more detail shame based discipline is huge and i also talk a little bit more about that in a minute too but um basically when you act when your attitude so much about parenting is about energy and when you have dr ross green love the man he talks about kids do well if they can if you have that type of attitude 
then it will naturally lead you away from shame-based discipline, for example. Um, and feelings of being alarmed, I want to touch on this. I have a whole other presentation in the Parenting in the Age of Anxiety, and it's certainly a talk that's very popular and um, well, it was off and online. The fact of the matter is nowadays we're having more and more kids who are really dealing with huge anxiety issues as our parents, and that's got huge Im implications. Um, to seek a way to lower the alarm, and if you're not able to do it any other way, one of the ways to, to lower the alarm is actually to deaden your feelings, right? Um, and the interesting thing is if your children are feeling your alarm and, and separation is one of the huge causes for alarm because we have a primal need for food, we have a primary need for psychological nourishment, which is that connection, that alignment with a one at least one core adult in their life. And when we don't get that, when our children don't get that, um, or children in general, they are forced to deaden their emotions because it's too painful. And ironically enough, that can lead to things like thrill seeking, where you've got kids who are not experiencing the alarm that they should. So it's such a weird situation. Just like those sensitive children can turn out to be bullies because they deaden their emotions. Um, a child who underneath those dead emotions actually had too much alarm going on, you know, a tendency, they were feeling lots of anxiety, they actually then can go on to become a thrill seeker. Um, and, and if not, um, your child can get triggered into like chronic debilitating anxiety. Um, both though are from the same root cause and both are on the rise. Um, as I mentioned, I do have a presentation on, on this, so I won't get into any more detail than that, but it's a huge issue. And again, we've got that, you know, chicken and egg because we've got more and more sensitive kids and we've got more and more situations that are wounding our kids. And so we've got you know, anxiety and, and things feeding back into that loop. Um, so immaturity is is another you know huge issue in terms of I talked about hardened hearts and that was all about the hardened hearts and how that contributes to children being uncaring. Immaturity is huge. Unfortunately, the fact of the matter is um, our kids nowadays, and we definitely see this in the young adults out there who we're stuck dealing with, and not necessarily so young adults either. But immaturity is a huge, huge issue. Again, to talk briefly about the definition, I think the definition is really helpful because if you think of immaturity as the state of being immature or not fully grown, I really like that definition much more than the second one when you talk about the example they give of behavior that's appropriate to someone younger. The thing is, when we see our child as immature and we realize that our responsibility is to create the conditions of maturation, then we're not critical of them. Then we can we come from a kids do well if they can place, right? If we think my child's 10, he or she should know better, then we come, we even get into that shame-based discipline because then the kid starts getting the message that they that there's something wrong with them, right? And we do, unfortunately, as humans, well, there's a good reason for guilt. For example, it's, it's an emotion meant to guide us, and it is a powerful emotion we need in order to be a communal you know, species who lives in, in community and who benefits from community. We need to be very sensitive to other people's needs and, and feelings and all that. So guilt is actually meant to be positive, but it gets toxic, and it kicks us into shame, and, and that's really, really unhelpful. So when we see our child as, oh, you know, they're immature, they're not fully grown, and that might be a 25-year-old, but that child just needs some help with the conditions, right? And it's crazy. I know I did so much. My maturation, I feel like the vast majority happened after giving birth at 30. Key, key to self-control is one of the things I want to, to oh, talk about. But actually, one second here. Um, Yes, okay, so just, just to explain, the key to self-control, when you think of immaturity and you think of raising caring children, the fact of the matter is we all have uncaring impulses. We all have you know, that knee-jerk reaction, but 
a more mature being is able to mix that reaction, is able to then go to the place of saying, yes, you know, I just want to, well, you know, even sometimes we want to scream at our kids and not saying, obviously, you're likely here because you're having issues with screaming at your, your kids. And, um, well, and that's a whole different thing. So the stronger your emotions are, the harder they are to mix. But, you know, when, when you're out in public and a grocery store person does something jerky and, and you have a negative thought in your head, the reason why more often than not you don't say anything is because you know how to mix your feelings, right? Um, and some of you may relate to when I came into parenting, part of the reason I so quickly was having issues with my little guy, my firstborn, is because I did not have a lot of maturity and my ability to mix my feelings was not high. Um, so just briefly, yes, you must be able to be of two minds, which is that you have to be able to say on the one hand, you know, on the other hand, so that angel devil idea of sitting on your shoulder, there really is something to it. And the stronger the emotion, um, the harder it is to mix, right? So that's why if you are having problems with yelling at your kids, it's because of your strong emotion. But even just seeing the situation differently, and this is why I really hope that you get some big insightful shifts here, seeing your child as doing as well as they're able to, and seeing yourself as the same thing, that can help you not even get as upset in the first place, and then it's easier to keep your cool. Um, the fact of the marriage, though, in, in, um, ability to mix your feelings takes a lot of maturity. So I said that I would talk about hardened hearts and immaturity as two of the reasons why our children have more and more children have hard hearts nowadays. I also am going to talk briefly about the flatlining of culture. And it's interesting. There is nothing wrong with friends. It, friends are important. We know that. And we are to some degree rightfully concerned about our children's friendships. And the reason I say to some degree, the fact of the matter is that your child can go through childhood not having a ton of, of friends and yet do very, very well, right? Um, and certainly parents of only children, I definitely like to emphasize to them not to worry too much about the friendships as long as your child is otherwise showing signs of, of healthy development right and definitely ideally your child has has you know at least even a couple good friends in their life the fact of the matter is though there's such a flat line of culture right now that we're really emphasizing peer contact peer connections in a way that never used to be the case if you go back you know even 70 80 years um definitely go back 100 plus years kids found themselves in a, a community they didn't find themselves in um you know more of this type of nap community of different ages and, and different backgrounds and some richness to their community in a way that nowadays they don't and it is fascinating because this natural community um, obviously Instincts are developed over a long period of time and instincts have been developed and have been honed so that when you're in a natural community, caring is very natural, very spontaneous and inevitable. Um, and our kids aren't in that type of situation as much. So again, that's why with a friendship, it, it I do want to say I'm not saying friends aren't important, but you don't want to emphasize time with other kids over time with you or time with extended family and that type of thing. Um, even homeschoolers, for example, so many studies, and while I, I don't advocate homeschooling per se because I see for many people it just does not work, um, although it can work beautifully for others, the fact of the matter is that one of the reasons why homeschoolers are so sought after by colleges um, across you know the certainly North America at a minimum is because of the fact that those kids are so mature and motivated and all those things that that follow from being mature and and developing appropriately and lots of that is because they are in right relationship with other people so more on that in just a moment but I really want to emphasize that um, when you've got kids with that flatlining of culture, when they're in that situation with their 
peers mattering so much, they actually have to harden their hearts because peers do not care for each other in the same way as um, somebody older does. And, and as you know, these extended community members care for your child in a way that keeps them able to have a soft heart. They're able to say stupid things or have off days and they don't get ridiculed, you know, things like that. So the more, and all these things feed in together. The more flatlined our culture gets, the more kids have their heart, hearts hardened, the less they're maturing, you know, and, and it's a real chicken and egg situation. So I wanted to make a note on why bullying programs don't work when we're talking about uncaring children and hardened hearts. It's a really apt time to talk about this. Unfortunately, bullying programs don't deal with hardened hearts. They all don't help with maturation. You know, and I'm not saying every single bullying program, but the vast majority of bullying programs out there do not help those children who are doing the bullying or the children who are bystanding with their hardened hearts. They don't help with maturation and they also don't put the kids in the right heart hierarchy. And we're going to talk about that right just in a couple of minutes, but the right heart hierarchy, because I've alluded to that as part of that natural community, but there, there's a number of reasons why bullying programs don't work there. I do know of a few examples of great programs where bullying does work, and it is something that schools really can get a hold, a handle on, but we have, as a society have gotten off on a very far off the down the wrong path, and we, it is really slow getting things shifted back in the right direction. I also wanted to give a, just a note on social media because even having referenced, you know, Sherry Turkle and Reclaiming Conversation and how she starts off the book talking about being brought into a school where 12 year olds were not being caring with each other and really demonstrating just shocking to us as adults, lack of caring with each other. The fact of the matter is social media is both a symptom of the problem and a cause. And I say symptom because children who are, for example, really peer oriented and not deeply aligned with adults in their lives, they will seek more social media contact. But of course, social media in itself uh, does so many things, but um, definitely takes out the elements of you know, seeing into each other's eyes, seeing how your words land on someone and all that, that are really important. So I had just let, about six weeks ago done a presentation of raising great kids in the digital age because it's critical. You want absolutely to watch social media, watch the, your limits around all of that. So now the last section is to talk about how to raise caring kids. And some of this I've already been alluding to, but for sure, we're going to talk a little bit about the soft hearts and how to keep your child's heart soft so that they are ironically, you know, like an oak tree, it's got some bend to it and therefore it's way stronger than, than it would be if it was rigid, it would break. Um, maturation, we're going to talk about that and its role in raising caring kids, right relationships, and how not to take away their instinct to care. So understanding the necessary conditions is, is so critical with the whole idea of raising caring children. Unfortunately, our instincts have gotten wonky, and our instincts are wonky because we used to be able to count on our kids having that deep connection, count on alignment with us. We can't anymore. Um, so all of this, the, the focus is on cultivating the right conditions and letting caring naturally evoke, um, not sculpting. And we've gotten so busy nowadays sculpting. We, we see evidence of our children being uncaring. So we're trying to dictate exact ways to, to show caring instead of nurturing their natural desire to care and love. Like just today, one of the inner circle moms in my group was sharing about how, one of my groups, she was sharing how she had done a beautiful job of creating the right conditions had a beautiful discussion with her son and he went off and apologized to that one. And she said like, wow, it was so fun that he spontaneously did that. Right. Um, when you think about raising, which really means bringing something to its full potential. Again, I, I want to inspire you with this idea of the, the gardening type metaphor instead of sculpting, because when we're sculpting, we've got a specific idea in mind. And nowadays, good heavens, like, 
doctor, lawyer, you know, entrepreneur maybe might be the, the third, that there's only a few really limited ideas that most parents are ascribing to and Ivy League schools and, you know, all sorts of really narrow definitions. That's a sculpting type of, of outcome you're looking at. Instead of, if you think of the promise of the mystery in the seed, you don't know actually what type of seed you're, you're raising. You might be raising the next Picasso, and, and in which case then you want to be focusing on the conditions that allow that beautiful seed to develop. So to, to have your children um, to keep their hearts soft, you want to manage their separation, manage their need for alignment, and you also want to shield them from wounding. So managing their separation, managing their need for alignment, um, like I said, you know, that, that's a whole webinar in itself, but I'm just going to say briefly that alignment is what you never used to need to know. I love to talk about, you know, I give the apple as a visual. Sometimes I like the rope um, visual because it gives that sense of that if you cut enough strands in a rope, it breaks, it frays and breaks, right? And, and a lot of times our alignment with our kids is really frayed and really broken, not because of us doing anything wrong. We're just following people around us and, and we're living in a world that has many ways that we are not um, able to, well, our alignment just, we can't count on it anymore. So that analogy I love to use is psychological gravity, right? That, that, so that's the apple is depicting gravity. And, and alignment really is psychological gravity. It's absolutely critical. You never used to need to know about it. Um, it's so fascinating, though, because the more you, you deal with your child's, for example, when they're little, their separation anxiety and, and deal with their need to be able to keep you close, at least psychologically, um, the more you help them with their attachment alarm, their alignment alarm, right, which is anxiety, um, is is triggered a lot by feeling like they're not in as deep alignment. With, you know, they can't keep you close, right? So, and sorry, I am going to go really quick through through this part, but that's really critical. Um, I talk about alignment in two ways: as the the line, and the reason I love talking about as the line, thinking of a you know. A, even an old-fashioned phone line has to be ages, but a cell phone line that if you ask somebody right now to do something for you and you weren't sure that they heard you, you know, it might be your husband, it might be your, um, you know, your co-parenting partner, your parent, whoever, if you aren't sure that they heard you, you wouldn't get mad at them for not helping you. And many times nowadays we actually aren't taking the time to pick up the line to make sure sure that we even have that with our kids and in many cases we need to strengthen it um, and then we're getting mad at them for not listening when, when in effect they didn't hear us um, even though they physically may have. Culture used to take care of this as I was saying before but not so, not near as much anymore. Um, and it is the one time where, where people who move to the west for example from more um, traditional cultures or live in, in somewhere in the West that is still in a more traditional culture can have it a lot better in this way. Um, psychological gravity, if you just think of how if your children, if gravity ceased to exist and your children were bouncing around, you wouldn't be upset with them. And, and this is an interesting analogy for ADD because definitely children who have ADD benefit a lot from having alignment strength. Right. And it is felt that, you know, there's there's different causes, but definitely that the decrease in, in alignment um, is one of the things that has fed into that increased diagnosis from the that's Dr. Newfeld and others will say that. So when you are clear that your children are misbehaving and they're uncaring, for example, because they the psychological gravity is weakened, then you see what you need to do as opposed to being mad at them and criticizing them, right? And evoking a shame response in them. Um, it's so important because it orients your children, alignment does in a hierarchy. And I will talk more about that in just a moment, but that's one of the many points that I make when I go into this topic in detail, and it's really relevant for raising caring children. So we'll get back to that concept in, in a moment, but the fact of the matter is one of the many reasons I like the GPS analogy, um, and, and I talk a lot about us being our children's strong GPS, for example, which includes making decisive choices and not autocratic bossy choices, but but 
being a, a strong leader for our children. The fact of the matter is our, our children, when they're in proper alignment to us, it just feels right to do what we want and then carry naturally evokes. Um, and that includes with our in um, educational settings. If our children are in the right alignment with us and we know how to transfer that onto a teacher, then our children will listen to the teacher so much more naturally. Um, anyways, more on that in a second. But managing separation, it's not just um, physical separation, as I alluded to before, because psychological and, and emotional separation is really um, in, important to consider. And it is wonderful because we are able to either reduce the separation or the perception of it. And I really like to emphasize the latter. I do want to say though that there are times where if when you're aware of this that you can reduce optional times of separation. You know, maybe this summer um, or even on weekends you'll choose to have more time, more gatherings with extended community or even just your own family instead of always focusing on a play date or another activity or things like that. And that's one of the many ways we've eroded our alignment with our children is that they don't see extended family as much and they often are in so many activities, right? So you might be able to reduce some optional times of separation, um, but the perception you can reduce by bridging and by matchmaking. And I'll explain both of those here right away. Um, so reducing optional times of, of separation I've already talked to, so I'm going to dive right into bridging. When it's fascinating because we used to have better words in English even for saying goodbye. If you imagine that your child feels like they're facing a chasm between when you leave, it's like they're staring down into the Grand Canyon and they can feel like they are lost. And literally, very young children have troubles imagining, you know, that they're going to see you again. And I know that seems sometimes we we just assume assume, right, that there, our kids will know that we're coming back or that type of thing. But um, old English, for example, goodbye actually used to mean God be with you until we meet again. Um, au revoir, hasta la vista, like some other languages have words that say, you know, see you again. And sometimes with our friends, you may start noticing with your friends and extended family, you might be better at, instead of saying goodbye, at saying see you later, bye for now, you know, things like that. Um, that's a really powerful, important way of psychologically giving your child the sense that, oh, there's a bridge, there's a, a way, there's a time when I'm going to see you again, and those words point to the fact you're going to see them again. Um, so there's a, quite a few nuances to this, but um, three ways to bridge is you can bridge forward, which is like see you later, see you, and see you next week, see you in a half an hour, whatever. You can bridge in the middle or in between, and that can be various ways. One is like texting someone um, to say, hey, I'm going to see you in a while, you know, you know, some sort of contact. But you also can bridge from the time you're about to leave them or when you first see them later. You can bridge the middle part by referencing the ways you were thinking about them in between and, and that type of thing. Um, and you can also bridge backwards, which is when you pick them up, pointing out that, oh, yeah, I was thinking about – you know, remember this morning I said we'd pick you up and after supper, well, here it is, you know, and you can just reference that, that time apart and point to the fact that, that clearly you got together again. So, so that's giving you the high level concept, but basically just start paying attention to the fact that you're making it clear that you're going to see each other again. There's so many ways you can do this. And sometimes some of the um, things that we naturally would do with a romantic relationship we can do, like giving a locket and all sorts of things like that. The other one I want to talk about is matchmaking, because when I talked about, for example, the teacher situation, there's so much you can do to be like that historical matchmaker who really their job was not just to see how you and someone else might fit well together, but then to point those things out. And in your case, you really do want to do both. If you're given an option between two teachers, two caregivers, two coaches, um, activities, you know, you, you will hopefully naturally do some matchmaking that you're trying to find that teacher who does really well with sensitive boys, for example, right? As opposed to the teacher who has 
hard on voice. Now, if you talk to the latter, then you can do lots to match make your child into that person, right? They match make. So we meet someone, you know, say we sit down in the airport and two minutes later we figured out that we both grew up, you know, I, I was born in Minnesota. Well, we figure out quickly that we're both um, perhaps born in St. Paul or something like that. Um, we do that because we are actually a radio way looking for the commonality, looking for the matches. So you basically consciously do that with your kids and there's a, a great way of making sure that your child basically sees your alignment, your connection with the teacher. So so many things you can do. Again, that's something though, to, to really give some, some thought into matchmaking. I can get more into that in a few minutes. So the other thing um, I will talk about, but this I'll talk about under maturation, is how we can shield our child from wounding because that is so important when we're talking about having soft hearts. So maturation, I'm um, and patient. And I know that it's so common, common for us to think that we don't have the time, that you can't hurry growth. Um, you definitely can slow down growth by your own reaction, can slow down maturation. But if you think about it, it there's a concept of slowing down to speed up, right? And definitely, if you want to speed up your parenting, take some time to focus on the roots, right? Um, it will make all the difference because not only will it speed up you getting to where you want to go, but it will get you on the path to ensuring you're going to get where you want to go as opposed to on the path that most people are that is really scary because maturation is not it's inevitable and spontaneous if the right conditions exist. But if the right conditions don't exist, your child actually can't mature. They, they stay stuck. And that is why. So that's where not to be <clears throat> critical of ourselves, not to be critical of our children. Because we are only as mature as the conditions were provided for us. And we can provide our own conditions if need be. Anyways. Uh, there's so much I'd love to talk about, but I talked before and in their immaturity. Well, you help your children with their mixed feelings if they, they have them, and that's a real key part of raising a caring child. Yes, sweetheart, you want that toy, you want to keep that toy now. You know, this is with a child who's, who's like five plus and starting to get their basically higher brain, the prefrontal cortex online. Um, you mix their feelings with the the whatever mix actually it doesn't matter but but in our family we share that can be a mix but it also another mix can be and i know that you know what it feels like to really want a toy and, and to have you know not be able to play with it and I, i'm wondering if you in a couple of minutes could share you know there's different ways you can mix but that's really important um and i do want to mention having talked about you know mixing their feelings if they have them if they're five plus and developing naturally, right? Because your child could be older than five plus and, and quite a bit older and still not have many mixed feelings, right? Um, definitely not mature scripting and, and just directing needs to happen is, is important. Um, one last thing, I'm not going to say anything more in any detail, but if you want to help your child with maturity, part of maturity is accepting the things they cannot change and cannot have. And on the other side of acceptance, is a child who will then figure out what the best path is, given that they can't have what they have, but what, have what they want. Um, but helping your child move from mad to sad is, is really critical. And we have a lot of kids nowadays, parents are helicoptering over them, trying to help their kids um, change things because they're aware that otherwise they're going to explode. But really acceptance is, is the super highway that you want. And when you're really able to, you know, keep your child's heart soft, right? Then, then they'll go to that sadness that much easier. So this is such a layered process that when you really work on a few of these key things, everything changes. So you don't have to know all this information, right? That's really, really critical for you to know. And of course, there'll be a replay as well. Um, so protecting your child from wounding, this is huge and it's a huge for your child's ability to mature, it's huge for your child's ability to keep themselves safe, it's huge for your child's ability to demonstrate and to feel and, and be caring. The fact of the matter is what wouldn't we do to protect our kids, right? We, we 
once we get that we know we want kids who are able to stand up to bullies and be leaders and all those different things, but the irony is they don't understand the way to get that child who can do that is to actually protect that soft heart by shielding them with their alignment, their deep alignment to us. When they matter so deeply to us, they no longer care so much about others, right? And and I could share a number of fun stories of, of examples of that. But the fact of the matter is protecting your child from psychological wounding is critical. Younger children and immature children need more protection, right? And that we, we naturally shelter a tender shoot a tender you know new seedling and we need to do the same with our kids. Um I just want to really briefly mention that so like I said, I'm really not going into alignment. It's the most studied aspect like in developmental psychology. I'm not even calling it by its proper name, but but alignment's a real thing, right? And I just want to briefly mention that, that there the deepest level of connection with another human being, the deepest level of alignment is that sense of being known. And when you're able to to convey to your child that you deeply know and care and love about them exactly how they are, quirks and all those quirks include the children that you're gonna help them with your you keep that your whatever however they are now you love them and they grow that is so so crazy protective because a peer cannot give them that peer cannot know. and their need for alignment is like social media that the more deeply your needs are being met by you the less they're going to seek out for those needs and watch and make sure that 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 um, that they're not going to, for example. So the barrier to that lack of alignment, and it's fascinating because it, it, the foul frustration that you feel, like Dr. Gordon Neufeld talks about having started in prison systems, and now when you walk down the halls of high schools and even junior highs and, and middle schools, you can feel that same rancid, you know, same foul energy, and and unfortunately kids when they don't have their deep need for alignment met it's like they're psychologically starving they're restless and and it's really massively frustrating and when you they can't get that from each other and so they can't satiate themselves it's really damaging to so you really want to focus on the whole um fostering conditions for maturation you want discipline that isn't separation based and as I said, I've mentioned some of these, you know, shame-based, um, separation-based, common discipline techniques, timeouts. The timeouts using the fact your child cares about being connected with you against them by making them go away and, and naturally causes them to shield and shut down from those emotions. You know, they want to, to attach and, and connect to somebody who's not going to do that. Consequence-based discipline, it's not that, that consequences and limits don't happen, but when you're using it, very intentionally to hurt your child and and cause them by a pain to make changes it'll work in the short run but it's ironic like one two three magic can work brilliantly in the short run especially if your child is deeply connected with you but it'll damage that connection and it's very damaging in the long run um rewards even are an issue as well and and yeah because they can end up feeling queer so amongst other things so how more points before I open up to see what questions you have? Um, right relationships is huge. I said there are four main points I was going to talk to, about, to you about for raising caring children, you know, soft maturation, right? Four generations of family, the kids who are in the and people who are in the relationship with you, it's just fascinating how it is. And that is why, when you get, the, I'm going to talk about, you can get a teen mom, birth, and value a great mom. And, and there are definitely beautiful examples of, of teen moms who have gone on to be great moms because their caring instinct has been invoked and they've been able to make it happen. Oh, cutting in and out. 
No way. Shoot, 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 shoot. Um, okay. Wish I knew how long that had been happening. That is horrible. Um, now, isn't that strange? Because just the other day, I referenced this before we got started to somebody having problems. Oh, better now. But that unfortunately oh. makes no sense. Thanks, Carolyn, for telling me that. But I don't know why it is better now. I will... I'll keep going, but please let me know right away if it's okay. It's corrected itself now. That is strange. Thank you guys very much, and I'm hoping it will continue to be good. Okay, so the interesting thing though, um, the teen mom study I wanted to reference is that they have, just as an example, when your children, so going back to the boxcar children, the reason why those older children now, um, the, I was reading there for a second about the audio, but the reason why the older children in the example in Nazi Germany, why they were getting, making decisions similar to a mother would of choosing to eat less and, and you know go hungry so that the younger ones were fed, is because when you're in the right relationship, literally, I think it's the equivalent of you, you look at the younger one, you know, and in the boxcar situation, the older ones looked at the younger ones and they realized, I'm it. Right? I am it. I am nature's answer. I meant there I'm meant to provide for this younger one, period. So the fascinating thing with the teen mom study is they studied it um, for a number of teen moms, they were showing them all the things that they should do, you know, how to change diaper properly, how to make proper meals, all these different things. A different group, they focused on getting them in the right relationship and really evoking that natural caring. And you can do that you know, with your own children for sibling rivalry situations by pointing out the ways that the younger sibling is looking up to the older one. You make sure the older one's clear of how, how impactful he or she is in, in their younger sibling's life. And so doing those type of things with the teen moms, you'll point out how the baby's eyes were tracking and watching for the mom and just how, oh my goodness, you're the center of this little baby's universe. And pointing out those type of things evoked the natural caring. So when they did follow-up studies for which one was more effective, dramatically more effective when the teen moms were put in the right relationship. So I'm not going to go into this into to detail except to say, again, this is insight-based. So I want you to start looking for situations where you can get your child in right relationships or highlight the fact that the right relationship exists, right? So with your children, yes, you're all equal in terms of their, your love for them, but, but starting to emphasize in a very positive way that the older sibling is, is really important and that they have a different role. You know, those type of things are really, really powerful. Um, really important not to kill instincts to care. And I, I know I'd allude to this in, in one of the emails about how the fact of the matter is it is crazy. The carrot and the stick idea of rewards. Um, we are doing so much to kill instincts to, to care. And it's a huge issue in schools because we're actually, we are trying to reward caring behavior, right? Like stars, whatever for kids to be caring. That's all wrong. It's just all wrong. Motivation is natural. Um, things like caring have to be intrinsic. They have to be evoked. You know, those boxcar children were not looking around for the reward they were going to get. They just got it that, that this was important. It's also, it's crazy because we hate seeing the way our kids often are seen lost. They don't have the self-esteem. They don't have the confidence. It actually, when you are rewarding kids for caring and taking away their natural instincts or, or kind of like eroding that natural instinct to care, you're taking away some self-esteem sources for them too, right? So the, there's lots of implications to this. In kids, schools, we've got the goofiest thing. We've got kids teaching kids to care, right? Kids teaching bullying. Now, a grade five student, and, you know, cross-graded options and things where you've got, you know, older kids, Caring for younger kids, older kids, teaching younger kids, that can be okay, right? But if you've got your kids in the right relationship in your schools and the kids are sh showing up caring for their lost audio now, darn it, darn it, darn it. That is very frustrating because I have no idea. 
back again. Okay, well, I'm going to keep going, but very sorry that we're having any issues there. So it's a huge issue with schools. You don't want kids teaching caring. You want instead kids in the right relationship. And in the schools, that includes to their teachers, right? There's so much you can do to help that even in a school that is not um, oriented that way, but particularly if you can get in a situation where you can influence the, the school as well. Um, getting them in the right relationship with each other because unfortunately when you've got your kids when they're peer oriented when they have to be defended against vulnerability you are not going to have caring children right and you're going to have massive issues with bullying so much more i could say about bullying as well that's a whole topic in and of itself um so what i covered today is i talked about an overview of caring and what it is why it's so important what makes children uncaring and i talked about things like hard hearts and immaturity and psychological wounding and then how to raise caring children in particular soft have raising your children to have soft hearts um sorry actually i'm gonna flip it ahead here because raising your children to have um oh yes sorry to have soft hearts i knew i'm realizing as i just changed this around a little bit that's raising children to have soft hearts working on the maturation, protecting them from wounding, particularly psychological wounding. And the last one is having your children in the right relationship with each other. Um, I am just about to open it to, to questions, but just before I say that, we have been lost. And I really want to emphasize the fact that as I alluded to earlier and said briefly, we really are parenting in the craziest time ever. You know, it's there's a juxtaposition because we've got the opportunity to be even better parents than ever before. But so many parents are lost. And sometimes I like to use the picture of like buffalo jumping over a cliff or lemmings, you know, leaving each other to their death. Um, what I talked about today is the tip of the iceberg. There's lots more that I could go into, but I really hope that you got a perspective shift so that you've got a GPS so that you, of course, you need to navigate with that GPS. You need to learn how to use it, and I'd love to help you with that. Um, but the fact of the matter is you now know the general direction that you're heading to, which is critical. So what do most parents and schools do now versus what works is most parents focus on behavior um, which is the fruit not the roots and if you think both consequences and rewards show a focus on behavior uh, versus focusing on the right relationships for focusing on keeping the hearts soft focusing on, on protecting of course those soft hearts and i could have also added a slide you know focusing on things like your child's maturation